In my mind, James A. Hearn's 1890 play Margaret Fleming is the transitional play in American drama from the sentimental melodramas of the 19th century and late 18th century to the stark psychological realism of the 20th century. I say it's a transitional play because while Margaret Fleming is the first play, as far as I know, in American drama to really incorporate realism in a meaningful way, it also retains many of the elements of the genre of melodramas. Although I do think that Margaret Fleming still works as a standalone play now in the 21st century, it's a lot easier to evaluate it if you understand the historical context in which it was written and performed. So. I'm talking here about melodrama, which was the prevailing mode of theater in America in the 19th century, and realism, which started, arguably, with Margaret Fleming in 1890 and became the prevailing mode of American theater in the 20th century, and still, and to this day, realism still exerts a huge influence over how we evaluate any kind of play, but in particular American plays. So when I say melodrama, what I'm talking about, and this is a genre, this isn't just a this isn't just a descriptive term. When I say melodrama, what I'm talking about is big emotions, improbable events, people talking in ways that they would never normally talk. Some examples of 19th century melodrama would be anything by John Howard Payne, Metamora by John Augustus Stone. So after Margaret Fleming came in 1890, and not immediately, but eventually in the 20th century, there was a shift to from melodrama to realism. And I'm talking now about playwrights like Arthur Miller or August Wilson. Realism is the opposite of melodrama. Melodrama is over the top. Realism attempts as best it can to capture what it's actually like to be human. So whereas in a melodrama, events happen that can never actually happen in real life, and that's that's part of the part of the play, that's part of the genre. In realism, that would be a criticism. Things that happen in a realist play are things that should actually be able to happen in real life. That's one of the conventions of the genre. What's interesting, and this has a direct bearing on how we evaluate Margaret Fleming, is that now that realism is the prevailing mode in American theater. We look back on the melodramas of the 19th century and the 18th century, and we find them lacking just because they are melodramas. The very conventions that make something melodramatic as a genre we see as flaws because realism is now the lens through which we evaluate plays. I'm, obviously, I'm being a little bit... Uh, I'm speaking a little bit generally here, I'm oversimplifying, but I do believe this is mostly true. Now, I want to be careful here, because I'm not arguing that these 19th century American melodramas are really good and people aren't reading them because of this realist bias. That's not, that's not my argument. Because something like Metamora, or somebody, especially somebody like John Howard Payne, there's a reason we aren't reading these playwrights. I, it's, I'm not saying that we're so devoted to realism that we're ignoring these amazing texts. I'm just saying that because something is a melo, the fact that something fits into the genre of melodrama that, or more importantly, contains some melodramatic elements, that by itself does not disqualify it from being able to be a good play. This is important when we talk about Margaret Fleming. I'm not arguing that melodramatic conventions like the one-dimensionality of characters or the over-the-top dialogue. I'm not arguing that those don't have their drawbacks, because they do. On the flip side, something being really realistic is not necessarily good drama. Uh, evaluating something primarily by its realism is a version of what you might call a mimetic aesthetic evaluative theory from the Greek uh, mimesis. Mimetic aesthetic evaluative uh, theories are ones that primarily judge the quality of a work of art by how realistic it is. And so this leads into our evaluation of Margaret Fleming because Margaret Fleming contains both melodramatic and realist elements. And coming at Margaret Fleming through the lens of realism, which is 
how we're kind of trained to growing up in 21st, 20th and 21st century America. I didn't grow up in 21st century America, just to be clear. But looking at Margaret Fleming through the lens of the 20th century realists can make it seem a little melodramatic, and we might think to ourselves, well, it's got this melodrama, and therefore it's not good. But that's not entirely, I don't think that's entirely fair. James A. Hearn kind of ends up getting the worst of it, both in his lifetime he did and now as we evaluate him in the 21st century, because Margaret Fleming was too realistic for the 19th century and now is too melodramatic for the 21st century. So um, Margaret Fleming was a huge commercial failure, and I want to read just a, a snippet of this 18, 1891 review in the New York Times that kind of explains why. Margaret Fleming is indeed the quintessence of the commonplace. Its language is the colloquial English of the shops and the streets and the kitchen fireplace. Its personages are the everyday non-entities that some folks like to forget when they go to the theater. The life it portrays is sordid and mean, and its effect upon a sensitive mind is depressing. The stage would be a stupid and useless thing if such plays as Margaret Fleming were to prevail. So that's what critics thought of James A. Hearn's play when it came out in 1890, which is why it was not commercially successful. That's, and that's because they were expecting melodrama. And of course, you as 21st century theater goer, if you went to a playhouse and saw something that had, was a melodrama or had melodramatic elements, you might find those elements mawkish or childish because you're expecting realism. But Margaret Fleming succeeds both in its melodramatic elements and in its realist elements. So I'm not going to read extracts from Margaret Fleming because it isn't that kind of play. But I do want to note a moment at the end of the second act that really shows the kind of innovative realism that Margaret Fleming inaugurated in American drama. And I want to talk about the end of the play because I think it's the most melodramatic part. And you can kind of see the, the junction of realism and melodrama just by me talking about these two parts. You'll have to evaluate the play by itself by reading it or seeing it performed, I suppose, if you can find a, you can find a playhouse performing it, because it's, like I said, it's not the kind of play where quoting it is really going to show you how good it is. It's a good read, or otherwise it wouldn't be in the canon. So there's a moment at the end of the second act. The, the general plot of Margaret Fleming is that a man cheats on his wife, and things go badly from there. Uh, he sires an illegitimate child, and the, uh, the woman, the adulteress, the woman who he cheats on his wife with, she ends up dying, and through a kind of hard-to-believe series of decisions, Margaret Fleming, who is the, the wife in question, decides to uh, rear both that child and her legitimate child at the same time. And also, she's so stressed out from finding out about the adultery that she goes blind. And, and the explanation of that is, is at the time, I'm sure that the science was believable enough, because this is a, a, at least a quasi-realistic play, but it's, it's pretty funny now. But it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be. What is really interesting about Margaret Fleming is that while, although the reader already knows, this is in the second act, the reader already knows about the adultery, the reader has already turned against Mr. Fleming, there's a moment at the end of that act where Mr. Fleming and his wife are hanging out and she is, this is dramatic irony, right? She is really happy because she doesn't know about any of the stuff that's going on. And she's trying on a dress for him. And he is feeling this kind of uh, marital joy that you would feel if you're hanging out with your wife and everybody's happy. And although in the back of his mind, you know that he's worried about the adultery and whether or not she's going to find out, he doesn't display that on stage because it's this kind of, this kind of pure moment of espousal love. And so she's trying on this dress, and there's a thread on the back of the dress, and he says, oh, honey, there's a thread on, on your dress. Let me get it. And he goes over and gets it, pulls it off, and then somebody else comes in, and the scene moves on. There's no reason for that part of the scene to happen. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's never referenced again. The thread doesn't have any real figurative or metaphorical value or content. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's just something that might happen in the real world. The, in the final act of the play, we learn that uh, Margaret has gone blind from the stress. The doctor had actually warned her, oh, you might go blind if too much stuff happens to you. And then, of course, she does. We learn that she's gone blind, that she's decided that she's going to bring up not just 
her child, but also this illegitimate child, and that she and her husband, everything's kind of going great. They, she's, she's like, well, I can't 100% forgive you, but I think may, maybe we can work it out. And the very end of the play, I actually, I'm going to read the very last part because I think it really shows, I think this would be, Philip is his name, by the way, I haven't said that. I think this is where you, where you can really see the melodrama. Um, so Margaret says, ah, dreams, Philip dreams, and we must get to work. Philip is inspired by her manner, and there is a quickening of his spirit, a response to her, and the new vibration in his voice. Work! Yes, I'll not wait until tomorrow. I'll go to the mill now. He works at a will. No. Margaret. That's fine. Do it. Philip. Yes, I'll take a bath and get in some fresh clothing first. Margaret. Do. You must look pretty shabby, knocking about for a week without a home. Oh, he had to... He left for a week, because, you know, all the, country, all the stuff that happened in their life, the adultery and such. Philip. Oh, I'll be all right. I'd like to see Lucy. He looks about. Where is she? Margaret is at the table, occupied with the flowers. Margaret, they are both out there, she indicates with a turn of her head. In the garden. Philip goes quickly to the door, opening upon the garden, and gazes out eagerly. Margaret, at the table, pauses in her work, gives a long sigh of relief and contentment. Her eyes look into the darkness, and a serene joy illuminates her face. The picture slowly fades out as Philip steps buoyantly into the garden. And that, that ending, I don't think, is satisfactory for 21st century uh, readers of drama. And I, I must admit, admit, I wasn't a huge fan of it. But I do think that despite the awkwardness, despite the criticism you could level at the ending, I think Margaret Filming is still a good play. I think it's worth reading, and I think it deserves its place in our canon. And as always, for more content like this, you can follow us or become a patron on Patreon using either the website or the app. We are the American Canon, and thanks for listening.